hear it. I open this uh, academic session in which Mr. Martin Ot Ottenhoff will defend the academic thesis on the ubiquity of movement, a decoding perspective on widespread motor-related neural activity. I welcome you and your paronyms and wish you lots of success, of course. And I welcome also your supervisors, Professor Tim L, Dr. Herf and Dr. Kubben, also the members of the assessment committee, and of course, uh, your audience on site and online. But before we start the opposition, I'll give you the opportunity to tell your audience a bit about your PhD thesis. Thank you, uh, dear Prorector, members of the Corona, uh, friends and family. Uh, today I will present a summary of my thesis uh, that's now in front of you. And my thesis is titled On the Ubiquity of Movement. And the introduction starts with the definition of the word ubiquity. Presence everywhere or in many places, especially simultaneously. And I particularly choose this title because movement really is everywhere in our lives. Because nearly any decision you will make will eventually lead to some kind of movement. And if I decide to make a cup of coffee, I need to grab a cup and make one. And if I want to convey my work and ideas to you, I need to move my head and eyes to make contact with you and also move my mouth to produce speech. And unfortunately, for some people, they are severely limited in the way they can move. And this has a great impact on not only their lives, but also the lives of their caregivers. So we have to restore movement for these people, uh, and therefore uh, we can give them the independence again to move again. But how do we move? So movement starts in the brain where an idea or an intention has to be translated in some kind of muscle movement, for example, arm movement. And this intention is transferred via the brain through electrical signals to the nerves, to the muscles. And the muscles then contract, and then you get a movement. Now, for people with ALS or spinal cord injury, the bridge between the brain and that movement is broken. And to restore movement for these people, we need to make a new pathway from the intention of movement to some kind of output. And we can do this by recording neural activity directly from the brain to capture this intention. And then we translate this into a, in a movement output, for example, a robotic arm. And this system is called a brain-computer interface. And it has three main components. A recording part, a decoding part, and a control part. So the decoding part translates the things that we record into a control output. And here I show a robotic arm, but this can also be a prosthetic arm, a wheelchair, or a spelling computer. So let's look at the recording part. Historically, to decode movement, we've been recording from the motor cortex, and specifically the small area indicated by the red square. But recently, scientists have found that apparently the whole brain seems to be involved with movement. So this is an example of a rat on a moving wheel, and it needs to move the wheel either left or right. And just before and during movement, you see the whole brain lighting up with orange movement. Now, if we want to record this brain-wide activity in humans as well, we need to expand from this small square to the whole brain. And here in Maastricht, we can do so because we can record with these rod-like depth electrodes, as you can see on the slide here. Each sphere is a part where we can record activity. And for this example, so this is one participant, we can already record from over 100 locations. And these are used for the treatment in epilepsy patients. These suffer from uh, medication-resistant epilepsy, and they are implanted via small burr holes in the brain. After implantation, they go to a monitoring center, where they're being monitored for two to three weeks. And then, in that time, I come by to do my experiments. And this is one of our participants doing one of our experiments. Now, these electrodes are called stereotactic electroencephalography, but we will just call it SEG for short. Now, I said we're going to record from the whole brain, but if you look at the image, we only cover a small part of one hemisphere. But if we combine the electrode locations of many different patients, for example 16, you really see that we cover the whole brain. Now, the question I've been working on during my PhD is, can we decode this widespread brain activity into movement. And I specifically say decode, because we're looking at a future BCI application. So we want to predict from neural activity whether someone was moving or not. 
And therefore the subtitle is also a decoding perspective because we're looking from this pre predictive uh, angle. But first, we need to evaluate whether we can use these SEG electrodes to decode movement. So I did a simple experiment. We had eight participants. Each color are the electrode locations of one participant. And you already see that we cover the whole brain. And we asked them to continuously open and close their right hand or their left hand for three seconds. Then, at the same time, we record neural activity from each of these spheres. And then we get the millivoltage over time, so an electrical signal. And now we're going to make a prediction. So from this small part in blue, we make a prediction and we say, well, this is movement. And then we slide the window a little bit over and we make a next prediction. So we have move, 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 rest, etc. So then we have a prediction of the whole time series. And now, because we made a prediction, we can compare this with what actually happened and see how well we did. So these are the results, and what's important to read from this graph is that if we get a score of 0.5, it's just as good as just randomly guessing, so we just say whatever. If we get a score of 1.0, we get a perfect prediction. And if you look at, for example, the first uh, participant, you see that we get a really high score. So we can differentiate very well, if we're this participant, between movement and rest, and also between left and right hand movement. But if we look at participant six, you see that we're not doing a much better job than just randomly guessing. So what we conclude, can conclude from this study is that SEG electrodes can indeed be used for BCIs, but with varying success so far. Now, we think this varying success comes from the different electrode locations for each participant. So for each participant, we capture different parts of the brain. And perhaps we capture the same network of movement-related activity but at different locations. So now the question is, can we find the same representation for different electrode locations? And then we answer this question in chapter three and four. So we return to the experiment that I explained to you before, with these eight participants, where we ask them to continuously open and close their left and right hand. However, we also ask them to imagine movement. And this is important because now we're testing this algorithm with people that can move, but it needs to work for people that cannot move anymore. So we recorded movement and rest trials, so where someone moved or didn't move, as you can see in red and blue. And now for each black line is also the data from one electrode. And this is just a short uh, excerpt for over 100 electrodes. But now we are looking for the underlying pattern in all this neural activity. So we're going to squeeze this 100 dimensional data down into just three dimension. And if you plot this three dimension, you get these lines. So in the rest trial for three seconds, the neural behavior looks like this. And for move, you can do the same. And for the next trial, you can do the same. And if you look at these lines, they are not particularly informative by just looking at them. But what we can do is we can capture the behavior of these trials, so the changes over time and the relationship between those variables uh, by getting a numerical representation. So one of these matrices is a numerical representation of what happens in that line. And then from all the movement trials and all the rest trials, we can take the average. So we have a stereotypical or uh, uh, matrix of move and of rest. And we call these the neural dynamics of rest and the neural dynamics of movement because they capture the changes over time. So now we have uh, the numerical description of what a typical movement trial and rest trial looks like. So if you have a new trial where we don't know the prediction, we can just compare them with what we learned so far. So if you compare them to rest, we get a distance of 2.5. And if you compare them to movement, we get a distance of 0.5. And the lower the distance, the higher the similarity. So distance of 0.5 is the lowest, and therefore we say this trial must be movement. So let's evaluate how well this algorithm works. So uh, on the left, you see the performance of actual movement and on the right of imagined movement. And again, 0.5 is randomly guessing and 1.0 is a perfect prediction. And you can see that for actual movement, we can do this quite well. And for imagined movement, we can do this reasonably well. Now, if we capture the same underlying representation of movement for each participant, then there must be overlap in the information between participants. And therefore, what we did to evaluate this is that we trained our decoder on the movement of participant one 
and we predicted whether someone else was moving, so participant 2. And for most, uh, for most participant pairs, we were able to do so above average. So, if we look at the numerical scores, so this matrix is a representation of the same values you see at the top, and we pick one very good performing one out, as indicated by the black circle, then we see that the electrodes of these patients are really are at different places um, in the brain, and still we can make a very good prediction. So, since we captured the same motor dynamics of the whole brain, so we capture data from the whole brain, we call this the global motor dynamics, this underlying pattern that I've been talking about. And the exciting implications of these results are that global motor dynamics might enable calibrationless or plug-and-place BCIs, where the motor BCI just works out of the box. And this is not only time efficient, but also they might allow BCI to, use, uh, to be used for people who cannot move. We're using data from people that can move. But this is a very simple experiment. We just said someone moved or didn't move. So what about more complex movement? So I made a new experiment where you continuously track the hand in 3D space. So on the left you see our experiment where the participant controls a fish on the water and they need to pop the bubbles by moving the fish to the bubble. And the black rectangular square at the bottom continuously tracks the motion of the hands and on the right you see a graphical representation of the trajectory of the hand. So, by having these 3D coordinates of the hands over time, we can also calculate other kinematics, for example, just the hand movement speed regardless of direction. At the same time, we record neural activity from the brain. And these are, there are the electrodes from one participant, and orange, move, orange means that there is more activity at that time point. And what I hope you can see is that, again, for this 3D hand movement, the whole brain seems to be involved. Now, we're going to do the same as the previous experiment, but in a different method, where we use, you use this high-dimensional data and transfer this back, squeeze it back in only three dimensions. So these are x0, x1, and x2. And then from these three dimensions, we can again make a prediction what the participant was doing at that time. So the black line, as you can see, is the actual hand movement speed, and the orange line is the predicted movement speed. And as you can see, the orange line follows the black line quite well. But let's also evaluate this numerically. So these are the correlations, which means how similar are our predicted trajectories and our actual trajectories. And the score of 1.0 means that we make a perfect prediction. If the score is below the black line, then we just can just randomly guess and we're doing just as good. So if we look at the directional components, you see position, velocity and acceleration, and we have x, y, and z for each of them, which means forward and backward movement, left and right movement, and up and down movement. And uh, as I hope you can see, is that we're not doing a really good job for any direction so far. But if we look at the non-directional part, we see that we can get a quite good performance. So let's zoom in on the speed performance. So these are the individual scores for speed. So these are our 16 participants that uh, participated in our research, and for each participant we were able to, de to decode and predict the hand movement speed over time. Of course the variation is there, but regardless of electrode placement, we can decode above chance. So, so far, more complex movement can be decoded as well from these global motor dynamics, but direction is still a challenge. So finally, these are the chapters 2 to 5, and for my whole thesis we can conclude a few things. SEG electrodes seem to be an excellent tool to capture this brain-wide global activity. And global motor dynamics can be recorded throughout the brain and used to decode across tasks and across participants. And global motor dynamics contain at least non-directional movement speed. And together, these three conclusions expand the view from this small area that I showed you before to the whole brain, as there seem to be relevant information throughout the brain. And as such, the results for, form a new basis for more comprehensive VCIs that capture more essential information to restore movement for those who need it. And finally, I would like to return to the title of my thesis, On the Ubiquity of Movement. I started with the notion that movement is everywhere in life, and I want to end with the notion that the brain activity related to this movement is also everywhere in the brain. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and give the word back to the Pro Rector. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Candidate, for your presentation. We are now starting the opposition, and we start with the first opponent, who is the chairman of the Euro Assessment Committee. That's Professor Mess, and he's Professor of Clinical Neurophysiology in the Maastricht University Medical Center. Professor Mess. Yeah, thank you. Well, dear candidate, früher war alles besser, or everything used to be better. When I was a student, there were broad man areas. Number four, the precentral gyrus was the most important place where movement emerges. It's not that simple anymore, certainly not after reading your thesis. Thank you for that. But more on that later. First of all, I would like to congratulate you and your team of supervisors, of course, with this uh, thesis. That indeed has aroused something in me somewhere between wonder, disillusionment and fascination. Okay, so let's go to the questions. And I would like to focus on chapter three. In your introduction, you mentioned that even handwriting already can be deciphered. Well, that's cool. What kind of information are we then lacking? I mean, in other words, what problem has to be solved? Highly esteemed Fogent, uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, are you mean, meaning the handwriting decoding? Or yes, I mean, that sounded to me quite intricate to decode handwriting. I mean, that's, that's really fine movements. So what is then the problem you want to address with your approach? Which part of the BCI are we missing? What kind of information or... Um, so the study that uh, decodes handwriting is indeed from the motor cortex and they did that quite well. Um, and that's for people to communicate again. So for example, for locked in patients mm -hmm. uh, who can't talk or do anything anymore, then they can just imagine uh, hand movement speed of uh, handwriting and then they can use that to communicate. Uh, but there are many different uh, BCIs that are, exist and there are different applications for different people with different yeah. uh, backgrounds. Um, as far as I'm aware for the um, motor cortex decoding, um, they show good performance, but they also have some limitations. For example, the prediction speed. So you have, for example, the work from uh, Pittsburgh where they include also um, sensations and then the speed increases with like uh, a, a few folds. So okay, so this is a little bit fine-tuning um, the movements, right? Yeah. As I understand you right. Okay, so you tried to address the problem and um, which pa patient population did you examine? Just a very short question and a very short answer. Uh, epilepsy patients. That's right. And did these patients have problems with their motor system? No, as far as I'm aware, not. No, I don't think so. And um, in your findings, uh, did you find any difference in decoding performance between real and imagined movements? Yes, imagined movement is usually lower. What is the reason for that? Uh, the reason for imagined movement, as far as I'm aware, is that the signal strength is a little bit less. So How can that happen? I mean, that's a little bit strange, right? So actual movement is usually uh, believed to come from the... Uh, motor cortex, it also has a lot of descending pathways to the, uh, to the hands. And, uh, but you excluded body. the motor cortex from your, from your analysis, so it should have been the same. Um, or not? No, yeah. So the thing is, it's very hard to pinpoint what we're actually decoding. As we know that it works, and in that specifically that chapter we tried this so well. Look, there is information that you can use to decode between move and not move, mm -hmm. um, and the electrode locations are also different every time. And we know that the imagined is, signal is a bit uh, weaker than the movement part, so it could also be closer. Also, generally, the implantations are in a different area, for example, mostly temporal yeah. and hippocampus. I mean, if you perform an actual movement, isn't it qualitatively quite different from not performing the actual movement, but just consider considering or thinking of it. Yes, it is. And also for the imagined part, it's also, uh, it's also a skill you need to learn to imagine movement. So people, some people have a really yeah. hard time to imagine movement. So my point is, if I do an actual movement, there is something like proprioception, right? Couldn't it be the case that the sensory feedback to the motor system is missing in the imaginary part, and this is why your signal is weaker? 
Uh, that might be, I don't know exactly. Okay. Um, I think I have still two minutes, so um, yeah, let's go, with, uh, let's go on with some German. Warum einfach, wenn es kompliziert geht? Which means, why keeping, it simple, why keeping it simple when you can do it in a complicated way? When I, um, so let's have a look at chapter two. There you, uh, your AUC, and you just explained to us what it means, was just fantastic with 0.94. And that is in contrast with the results of chapter three. So the question arises, why performing all the hassle with leaving out the motor cortex in chapter three and for, uh, uh, on top of that, applying a more complicated data analysis. What's the idea behind it? What's the reason? What's the goal? So in chapter three, we wanted to show that there is motor-related activity that you can decode outside of the motor cortex. Mm -hmm. So we particularly removed the motor cortex to say, well, we can at least be sure it's not from the motor cortex. Uh, we also compared it, but there was not much difference in the first place. Yeah. That was the reason why we chose different <coughs> methods there. Okay, but what's the possible use of that information if it is only a copy or, let's say, a minor version of the information you can get from the motor cortex? What, what additional information could you uh, get from outside the motor cortex? So, from a BCI perspective, we don't know at this point. So, we, what we just see, and also recent evidence uh, from other studies show, is that there is motor-related activity that's more than just... Uh, what people say arousal or stuff. Um, so at this point, we're, what I find so far is there is more, but it's really hard to pinpoint what it exactly is. But there seems to be more information that might be relevant. Yeah, I think you, you did very important work. This is the first step. And maybe this has something to do with the fine tuning we have been discussing. I'm satisfied with your answers and I give back the word to the pro -rector. Thank you very much, Professor Metz, for your position. Now <coughs> we come to the following opponent, who's also a member of the assessment committee. That's Professor De Weert, and he's Professor of Neurosciences of Perceptual Learning and Attention in the University of Maastricht. Professor De Weert. Dear candidate, um, I enjoyed reading your thesis a lot. Uh, it was a very nice thesis, well written, with very interesting um, findings and experiments. Um, and I want to congratulate you on, on all the work you've done. It's a massive thesis, actually, with lots of work done, and also your uh, supervisory team. Um, I would like to go back to one of the things that you said in your presentation. Um, so you showed this mouse, and you saw the whole brain um, lighting up when the mouse was going to the left or to the right. And you're sort of presenting this as if this is motor activity or motor-related activity. Um, why do you say such a thing? Ali, esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words. Um, so the study, uh, I showed this as an example, mostly showed that the whole brain seems to be active. Mm -hmm. But the paper also goes more into depth on that there really is, it's related to action of the mm -hmm. mouse where the whole brain seems to light up. And this is mm -hmm. calcium imaging. Um, and there are several other nature and science papers that also show that it's really related to movement. There's a lot of spiking activity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the basis, especially why I showed this one. It's yes. an illustration that. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, um, you're very much emphasizing this idea of the ob ubiquity of movement. That movement would be everywhere, but I would like to entertain an alternative hypothesis, um, and that is that um, what's happening outside motor cortex and let's say um, the typical motor related areas um, may have very little to do with movement and that uh, in some way it's associated, but it's not really motor movement. And that's the association itself that somehow gives you some ability to decode, for example, movement versus non-movement which in fact are, relatively speaking, quite a-specific things. Um, would you agree with that or what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so movement, yeah, I specifically say it as movement is everywhere in, life, in, in, uh, in the brain and in life, but in our papers we also say it's motor-related activity. So mm -hmm. we're not necessarily saying it's particularly the descending pathways, for example, for hand <laughs> movement, because we know they are mostly from the motor cortex. Mm -hmm. um, 
but they seem to be elicited by movement, and they seem to be involved in movement. Uh, and there are also a few studies that are also building on those red studies I showed before, that um, they also show that there's like this, yeah, it's a new paper, I haven't fully read it, but they mentioned something like the action mode network, so it's like the engagement of movement uh, in there. And therefore we also did, for example, chapter five, where we did a continuous hand motion tracking where we could track the speed of the hand for uh, most patients. Uh, also to show like it's more than just movement versus not movement, there's actually, we can, there's some scaling factor in there. So. Yeah. But again, I find it really hard to make conclusions at this point to say, well, this must be, um, this is this particular process or yeah. related to this. Yeah, I think so. One difficulty is, of course, that uh, you're dealing with association cortex and uh, obviously uh, a lot of things are happening there. Um, I'm, I'm also wondering about the, the setup that you have in, in general. So you're working with patients and I'm just thinking, for example, uh, if you instruct patients to move the left hand and the right hand, I think they would move their head, they would move their eyes, um, the visual input will change, um, there is changes in uh, the movement that is processed in different reference frames, uh, and so forth and so forth. So is it possible that you're actually decoding that and that what you're decoding strictly has nothing to do with the movement? So I cannot say we're not decoding that, but if we also have a study where we can decode such relatively small uh, changes mm -hmm. uh, or weaker signals with these electrodes, that would also be a great finding. Yeah. Um, but movement is, the, uh, in my opinion, the most, uh, the best explanation. Yes. But yeah, for, for example, when we get reviews, uh, because reviewers also usually have a lot of critique on this I'm work. I'm sure they actually <laughs> give you the same kind of comments that I'm giving yeah. you. So, for example, they, uh, they say as well, you might be decoding arousal, but if you then look at the participant sitting there, they are sitting like this, and you're like... Mm -hmm. So, if we could decode arousal, that difference in arousal, I would be very happy in the first place. So mm -hmm. I think it's an unlikely explanation, but I can't say it's not uh, involved in yeah. some way. Yeah. That's interesting because I would have exactly that question. Um, but for example, you're, you're emphasizing the decoding of speed. Um, and I think uh, somebody who moves the hand or when you do movement slow or, or extremely fast, I can imagine that this has consequences for momentary arousal, attention and, and, and so forth. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so we're decoding uh, movement speed and therefore I say movement speed, but um, my impression so far is that there seemed to be some kind of scaling factor which could indeed be fast movement and slow movement yeah. uh, and then it picks up on that scaling factor. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's also, uh, we're not there yet to make yeah. conclusions. Um, if you allow me another sort of critical question. So in uh, one of the chapters you're also showing that when you drop um, measurement points or electrodes that actually the, the, the classification actually doesn't suffer that much. And so you sort of interpret this in a positive way, so I'm going to permit myself to do it the other way. And I'm going to say, look, the fact that you can just drop so many ele electrodes is actually a further illustration of the fact that you're not measuring anything specific. What would you say to that? Uh, that might be, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if we're decoding between movement and non-movement, that experiment is not precise enough to yeah. make conclusions about that. But what we see so far is that we at least can say, well, it's not this performance that we get from decoding full of brain is not coming from the motor cortex, at yeah. least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, indeed, it's very hard to specify, especially also with the different electrode locations to, yeah. for example, investigate one particular area and see, well, maybe that's driving yeah. the... The performance. Yeah, is this, is this in any uh, way a goal of yours to sort of like figure out what you're actually decoding outside motor cortex by doing more careful experiments, um, so more controlled experiments, or do you say I'm happy with what I have? Um, so. I'm mostly interested in the really BTI as, uh, aspect. So can we find more information that we can predict, that we can decode into some kind of movement output? Mm -hmm. um, so 
even though it's important to understand what's actually happening, for yeah. if we see that it works and it works reliably, mm -hmm. then it might also be good enough, at least for the start, to yeah. use it for BCI applications. I, I think I have to be, I am satisfied with your answers and I give the word back to the proverector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor De Weert, for your position. Now we come to the following opponent, who's also who's also a member of the assessment committee, is Dr. Collinger, and she is Associate Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in the University of Pittsburgh, and that is in the USA. And uh, thank you for coming all the way, Dr. Collinger, albeit online. And thank you for early rise. It's 7.30 in uh, Pittsburgh now, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, Mr. Kennedy, I'd really like to congratulate you on a job well done. It was a pleasure to listen to your presentation and to read your thesis. You should be very proud of all the work that you've done. Um, congratulations to your supervisors as well. I wanted to um, you know, start my questions maybe by picking up a little bit on, on where we left off with the last um, panelists and, and trying to really understand how much information we think we can get from these recordings. And so you did see some variability across the different participants. Do you have any sense for what drove that? Was it electrode placement or was it something else that drove the difference between participants? Uh, Stephen de Bowen, thank you for your kind words. Um, so uh, just in general, are you uh, referring to a particular chapter? Um, chapter two, for example. Are we, Where you were uh, showing the yeah, there we uh, did uh, LDA, this was a very basic experiment, and there we really think it's probably due to the varying electrode locations. So some have less electrodes, some have more electrodes, some cover the whole brain, some cover just a small part. Uh, and that's really, we think that's the main driver for performance. You think that there's any particular brain areas that you need to capture in order to be able to achieve the decoding performance that you did? Um, yeah, but it's very broad. I mean, probably if we have an electrode, uh, one or two electrodes only in the visual cortex, you're going to have a hard time decoding. Uh, but I think there are way more areas involved than, uh, uh, than is previously thought. For example, we, yeah, SMG in that area is always very involved. It also comes up high if we look at who, which electrodes are more important. Uh, yeah, but sometimes we also decode from temporal electrodes, for example, which is also uh, unexpected. But okay. Thank you. Um, it's, well, I guess maybe I'll stay on chapter two. So you did show compare decoding performance for models that used uh, beta band power and gamma power and showed that actually beta, if anything, did a little bit better, which was surprising to me just because in motor cortex, at least, gamma often tends to be the most informative about different movement parameters. Do you have a sense for why you observed what you did? Um, why beta performed as good? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we know that beta is involved with, uh, if there's less beta, you're like engaging in movement. For example, if that's too high for Parkinson's, then you generally have a problem. Um, and I think because that's a lower frequency power, then that spreads a bit more, so you can probably record that from more areas. Because the high frequency, uh, uh, the high frequency power is also more localized, uh, so then you need to be more, um, more precise in where you record in that place. Thanks. Um, so maybe based on that answer. Do you think the fact that you're picking up on these very broad patterns of activity is what facilitated um, the cross-participant transfer? I thought those results were really impressive. And I'd ask if maybe you could explain a little bit, did you need to do any kind of alignment or correction for these different electrode placements for those experiments? Yes, so we did a uh, principal component analysis and then a Riemannian decoder, which calculates the covariance matrix of the PCAs and then uh, this, the closest distance to the mean, so the geometric mean. So ideally you won't do a PCA beforehand because that makes independent, electro independent variables while then you look at the covariance matrix. However, we are forced to use some kind of uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm 
because we need the if we do want to do transfer learning, the input space is different for each participant. So for one, we have 100 electrodes. For one, we have 50 or 128. So then you can't uh, transfer learn anymore. So therefore, we need to bring them to a uh, the same amount of dimensions, and they also need to be ordered. Um, so yeah, the PCA is probably mostly driving the capturing the underlying pattern. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe for this last section, I'll just close related to chapter four. So you were looking at cross task performance and for that task, you were comparing right and left hand movements and whether you could transfer decoder to detect uh, rest versus move. Do you have a sense for how generalizable this is? Could you have done you know, right hand, right foot um, speaking? How specific do you think this finding is? For now, we, for now, here we only looked at uh, movement versus non-movement. So I, I don't know if, uh, for particular uh, laterality or other limbs. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be really interesting to think about whether you're detecting kind of this global intention signal, um, you know, or whether it's actually specific to the the effector that you're using. You know, if it's more developed for hand movements, um, could you distinguish between different grasp types? I think that would be really interesting. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. I'm satisfied with all your answers, and I'll see you back. Thank you very much, Dr. Collinger, for your opposition. Uh, then we come to the following opponent, who is also a member of the assessment committee, that's Dr. Van Steensel. She's assistant professor in brain computer interfacing in the UMC in Utrecht. And thank you, uh, Dr. Van Steensel, for coming all the way from Utrecht. The University of Maastricht is always glad with guests from outside. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, um, dear candidate. Um, congratulations on completing this work and also to your supervisors. It was a, a real joy reading it. Um, and I also want to uh, express my appreciation about your didactic skills. I think you have a good way of explaining complex concepts um, and a clear attention to consistent nomenclature, which is, I think, very helpful. Um, I would like to start with chapter three, where you zoom in on the non-motor areas and investigate if you can decode executed from imagined movements. And then in figure 3.3, you show that the relative contributions of the electrodes to the decoding result of the imagined task um, was driven um, you know, quite strongly by the more posterior electrodes. And um, I was looking for a figure that would show me this result for the movement execution task. Uh, it was not there, so I was, I was just curious. Did you see any consistency in the patterns? Did you also see for movement execution a similar posterior focus of the contributing factors? Uh, yes, we see that for both, actually. Okay. So, uh, for example, the SMG and that area around there uh, shows up very often. Okay, well, that, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, and I, I'm then wondering... Um, what could be driving that consistency? What is then the most the, the common factor that contributes to that that focus? Because in one condition they're actually moving, and the other one they're not. And your main focus is on movement itself. So, what exactly do you is your hypothesis about what we're looking at at that at that part of the brain? Uh, esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words. By the way, <laughs> should start with that. Um, so, the SMG in that area. Is, is of course uh, an integration center uh, as far as I'm aware. So this very neuroscientific point, which area does what? It's not my strongest suit, but I know it's a, an, an integration center is close to close to the uh, parietal cortex, uh, proprioception as well. Um, but you also have, for example, that study from uh, Bandot and all, where they decode both movement and speech from that same area. Uh, so. We are usually a bit puzzled by that area. I mean, on the one hand, it's very logical because it's integrated stuff, and uh, so it, it integrates a lot of stuff. So therefore, a lot of things will go on to eventually result in some kind of movement. But on the other hand, it shows up very often. So we are, yeah, it's one of the things we're still. <laughs> you see, this also in the other chapters that there's a focus there. 
Yeah, as, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I don't have heart for this exp uh, experiment mm -hmm. specifically. It shows up because in the later chapters we more look at the lower dimensional representation. So then you lose the information. But also in other colleagues, uh, it shows up very often. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, then I would like to take this more to um, to the next level because you have a, a very um, in, a high interest in, in developing BCIs, and um, you know you have mentioned that um, uh, you know you want to use this concept to bring BCIs uh, to bring stereo EEG motor related phenomena uh, to work you know usable BCI uh, settings. I think also my predecessors have already mentioned that you're probably looking at kind of a global phenomenon, maybe not very specific to motor, to movement itself. But I come from a world where I test BCIs in daily life of patients. And that life is very complex. And therefore, I think it's very important that you understand what we're actually looking at. So if you were to bring this concept to an actual BCI for patients, um, you know, what kind of considerations would you have? Um, what do you want to investigate further to, to take that next step? Yeah, so the challenge is always that we're not in the target population. So we can make a lot of statements that this will work for future BCIs, but we'll never share until we test it. Um, where I think my work is uh, can be valuable is, especially with the transfer learning and the cross decoding. So. Uh, for example, I can imagine that for someone who can't move anymore, or not at all, you can still uh, train it on people who can move, or people that are, uh, or at least, yeah, people, the data set of people where you can record it, train a decoder, and then make predictions of the person who can't move anymore. Because perhaps, maybe in that case, you can't train a decoder anymore. Uh, but of course, it should be a very simple application because we're decoding something broad. So, for example, a on off switch uh, where something goes on or off to start a system where more specifically trained uh, algorithms uh, may work. Okay, but even for an on-off switch in daily life, you know, there, there's all kinds of inputs. There's people walking by, pe people, you know, communicating. Um, how, what do you need, what do you think you need to assess to, to, to use this specific concept of the, you know, uh, more global phenomena of motor representation for VCI? Um, well, of course, you need to run experiments <laughs> with these uh, people. Okay. And I would recommend to then also take it to real life settings, such an experiment. Yes, yeah, absolutely. All right. I mean, okay. I wish I could. <laughs> okay. And then I would like to challenge you a little bit further and zoom out a bit more. Um, I, I do agree with you, you know, areas outside of the primary motor cortex can be definitely interesting, um, also for future BCI applications. Um, because there may be information hidden out there that's that's quite helpful. But also, um, and I come from the same um, field in that sense that, you know, stereo EG has replaced electrocorticography in clinical settings uh, significantly. And therefore we, and probably also you as a BCI researcher, have had to be a little bit opportunistic in taking stereo EG as a recording modality. And, you know, I share that, 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 that idea with you. So, but if you would... If you could start from scratch, you know, develop a BCI, what technique would you use and where would you put the electrodes? Uh, first of all, motor cortex, because okay. we can see with all the studies that they work uh, best by far. Um, probably with a bit more uh, newer, reliable electrodes than the Utah Airways, although they serve a good purpose, but they also uh, think from the 90s. Um, so, Motor cortex definitely, and the other areas, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint, especially because, yeah, as you said, what we're looking at is not very specific, and a lot of areas seem to contribute. So uh, it's really hard f at this point to say, well, these areas are involved as well, because so far we see that it doesn't matter that much where you implant, because you can always get some motor decoding. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, motor cortex, everything around the central circus, uh, for sure. The rest, not so sure. <laughs> okay. I, I'm I don't have enough information to, uh, yeah. to make a conclusion on that now. Lots to do still, obviously. Yeah. Thank you, I'm satisfied. I'll give the word back. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Steensel, for your position.
Now we come to the following opponent, that's Professor Peters. He is Professor in Mathematics of Knowledge Engineering at the Department of Advanced Computing Sciences in the University of Maastricht. And today he has also accepted the role of Secretary of this Assessment Committee, for which I am very grateful. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. And uh, dear candidate, uh, let me first uh, congratulate you with a very uh, nice uh, thesis. I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, There's a lot of interesting material, so thank you for that. And also thanks to your supervisory team. Um, yeah, I would like to continue some of the questions with, uh, with Chapter 3. We've already heard Chapter 3 a bit, but now from a different perspective, a uh, methodological perspective. And I've myself worked with Riemannian metrics in the past in my own thesis a long, long time ago. Um, and uh, I would not want to dive into the technical details of that. Um, but the method that uses that, the classifier that you have there, um, I was thinking, uh, you argue like, because it's so widespread, we need to find common ground to bring it all together in, in this one representation that we then can use, and then we do classification with that. Um, and I would expect from the, let's say, the AI point of view, uh, the, the methods that we have nowadays, that you could also go a different way and say, there are these ensemble methods that can leverage uh, a lot of different uh, weak classifiers, that you could locally train, maybe on different parts of the brain, and then have a kind of majority vote or another kind of way to combine their, their uh, classif uh, classifications to come up with an overall result. Uh, how would you look at that? And have you looked into these methods? Uh, because you didn't use it, but uh, maybe you had good reasons for not doing that. Could you comment on that? Ali, esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your uh, nice question. Um, yes, that indeed would be a very good point as well. Um, so I went with the Riemannian decoder because we know we saw it worked quite well on service EEG. So then you have a very noisy signal and then it worked quite well. So we figured if these electrodes are different locations as well, there must be a lot of things that aren't necessarily related to movement. So it might be noisy for the application that we have. So we went with the Riemannian uh, application. If we would do an assemble method, uh, and I'm assuming that you meet like from different areas that you maybe... Yeah. Have you ever heard of random forest methods, these kind of things? It, that is an example of an assemble method, the majority voting kind of things. You could also combine other uh, individual classifiers in such a way. Uh, yeah. Bayesian methods could be ensemble methods. Yeah, yeah the, the possibilities are endless, of course. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so... We, I haven't looked at it. Uh, they probably might work well as well. Yeah, because it, it could also complement the, uh, the approach you currently have, and you could see uh, if that would give you, uh, yeah, say, a bit more leverage of the data you have. Yeah, yeah especially absolutely. for patients where the current methods don't work so well. Um, okay, let me, let me dive into uh, another topic. So about. Um, the Riemannian metric itself, uh, I just want to make a comment uh, because you stuck to the kullback lipra uh, thing, which actually is not a metric, but an approximation of something. It's, uh, uh, it's a proxy. Um, but then in the, at the end of chapter three, you state, okay, maybe there is something and we should optimize these, uh, these Riemannian uh, metrics. Did you have anything in mind already, or was it just uh, a very open-ended? It really? was indeed a very open-ended one. Uh, I chose the kullback leibler divergence uh, because there was another study that compared them in service EEG, mm -hmm. and there the kullback leibler was uh, performing the best, and that's okay. the reason why I chose the kullback leibler Okay, but you had no other, other metrics uh, in mind to continue with, uh, should you have the time? No, not at this point, no. Okay. Okay, then I would like to, uh, to bring some movement uh, to the table. Uh, is there a paranymph uh, who could read uh, Proposition 8? Proposition 8. Global motor dynamics and changes thereof have the potential to provide a new tool to assess and monitor movement disorders. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think many will agree that uh, the way you phrase it there, it's, it's quite safe and no one is going to really disagree on, on the content of that. But my question relates to it, like, 
is this really all you had to say there? Uh, would you want to stop at that point, like, okay, uh, it's good for assessing and monitoring movement disorders, or do you have more applications in mind if that should work? Yeah, so what I had in mind uh, is, for example, um, I could envision this, of course, it's very early, this is quite fundamental, uh, but for example, for Parkinson's disease, uh, to that because the global motor dynamics uh, seems to capture some kind of scaling factors, some kind of change, that's why we decode the hand movement speed. Um, and I figured you may be able to use this scaling factor, so these changes thereof, to monitor uh, the severity of symptoms, for example. Yeah, and would you want to apply that also for treatment then? Uh, I don't know if it works well, so... <laughs> Yeah, so, so I, uh, I think you could include a few more things if you, uh, if you want to make a more challenging uh, statement there. Okay, so yeah. I'm glad to hear that you, you would like to also consider that. And maybe the, the other paradigm, if, uh, if I may, uh, could you read Proposition 7? Proposition 7. We need interpretable, non-linear, dimensionally reduction methods, especially when applied to the global coverage of SEEG. Yeah, thank you. So, so this interpretation of these uh, black box models that we often see in AI, that's, that's become a hot topic. And I was wondering, do you really need it in your applications? For, and for what reason? Um. So I think it's, we need to explore this because we're only using linear methods, which are very convenient because you can know what hap what's happening. Um, we have no guarantee that what we're recording, especially from the whole brain, is also a linear thing. So that's why I say we need to also have non-linear. And I know um, from the, for example, the robotic BCR for the motor cortex that non-linear method seems to stay more stable over time. Um, that was my... Okay, that's the linear, non-linear thing. Yeah? And what about the interpretability? Um, because you argue for that as well. The yeah. Position. Yeah, so this is the same part, because yeah, if we building a BCI, it's for people. So yeah, you need to know what's going on, or at least trace back where something went wrong, for example. So uh, this is usually the general problem with AI. If it's a black mo box model, it predicts something, and then something goes wrong, and you're... yeah. You don't know why or where you need to solve that. So especially because this eventually goes, uh, is, is about people, uh, it's important that we also need to, to be able to trace back. And aside from that, you're also, it will allow you to do more uh, scientific endeavors to show, to look at, okay, what's happening in there and why is it happening there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy with your answers. I give the word back to the ProRect. Thank you very much, Professor Peters, for your position. Now we come to the following opponent. That's Professor Van Sandbrink. He's Professor of Spinal Neurosurgery in the Maastricht University, University Medical Center. Professor Van Sandbrink. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, I also want to con congratulate you uh, with your thesis. I want to extend uh, my congratulations, of course, to your partner, family, friends, and, of course, to the supervising team. I have to admit that in reading your thesis, for me as a clinician, large parts were like Aga Kadabra. Uh, I couldn't understand what why I was reading. I hope you can enlighten me a bit. But the first things I read in a thesis are most times the propositions. And also here, the last proposition, it triggered me. So I want to ask one of the paranymphs to read the last proposition, proposition nine. Proposition 9. We have a brain for one reason, and for one reason only. That's to produce adaptable and complex movements. To understand movement is to understand the whole brain. Thank you. So this triggered me, and I, it was already in, our, uh, in your defense. There were, there were other things uh, which we, uh, we use the brain for, like imagination. Can you elaborate on this proposition? Why did you write it down, and why did you use this? Uh, humanity, awareness, thinking, imagination, all things we use the brain for. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your congratulations. 
Um, yeah, so this is a more a philosophical point of view, of course, because if you look at the visual cortex, then uh, yeah, movement might be less related. But the important part, why I wrote down this statement, is to, uh, that I find it important to keep in mind that the output will always be movement. So the interpretation, I think, from what's going on in the world is also related to this movement and what you can do with it. Um, so yeah, it's more, more uh, a point, a philosophical point of view that I think it's important to keep in mind that the, the one thing we do but is you produce agree movement. That brain, you, you use your brain for other things than movement? Yes. Of course. Thank you. Um, then uh, I was triggered uh, by your um, uh, um, the, the last chapter, uh, the impact chapter. Then you state in the, uh, one of the first lines that you are looking for targets for a new BCI. And now I read in the title of your uh, thesis, the uh, seniors are ubiquitous. Why are you looking for targets then? It is everywhere, the, those seniors. Why are you looking for targets? Um, yeah, so it's, it goes both ways. So using these as you SEG electrodes gives uh, a very good opportunity to look beyond the brain, especially invasively with high temporal and spatial resolution. Uh, but at the same time, we find that apparently it's everywhere, or almost everywhere. So um, the question we ask and what we find is in, in that sense, in that context, a bit contradictive because yeah, for looking for targets, if we were to choose now, we can maybe say, well, almost everywhere. So it's not really a particularly useful target. Mm -hmm. But still, you, you stated that you are looking for targets. And then I, I, I wonder, uh, then uh, a, bit li a few lines further, uh, you see uh, that, um, that uh, you, you state here to achieve all brain care, uh, areas that contain motor-related information essential for decoding need to be captured. Then you say again, I don't need a target, but I need the whole brain to be decoded, how do you see that in, uh, uh, how do you see this in practice? How do you, what is the future? What is, what, what will bring us this to us? How do um, yeah. So how, how do you, how, is it, how do you see it in front of you? Uh, when you close your eyes, you use your brain not for movement, for, for imagination. Yes. How yes. do you see it? <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, it's hard because we're looking for targets and then we see the whole brain light up. We don't have the electrode coverage to really always look at the same particular area. But then again, uh, there, we also see differences. So m some areas are more involved uh, than other areas. So there might like be Professor Mess said, uh, motor cortex. Yeah, so you found already a target. Yeah. yeah. But still you are. But it's products. also uh, from the motor cortex, we, still, we don't have a fully functioning BCI yet. Uh, so there is still information missing, and especially because the whole brain seems to be involved, there must, I believe there must be more information to be found. Okay. Yes. But it's very early to say, well, this particular area. And I, don't think, I also don't think it's a particular area, because targets may also be uh, a network, for example. Mm -hmm. So there is maybe a network... Uh, a larger scale network that you capture at different points. Okay, then then it confuses me uh, still a bit. Then uh, maybe you can help me. Then in the uh, few lines further or in the last paragraph of your impact paragraph, you talk about uh, Parkinson's disease patients. Thirty thousand already have an, um, um, deep brain stimulation, so sixty thousand uh, electrodes are implanted, more or less. And you see them as an ideal source of brain-computer interface. Or do I understand this falsely? Um, yes. Yeah, so for adaptive deep brain stimulation, I might see that uh, I might see but not, not for motor. Um, motor activity. Yeah, I think and it is very effective uh, for motor uh, symptoms, the Parkinson's disease uh, brain stimulation. So maybe you found already your targets then. Or? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm satisfied uh, with the answers. Thank you, Professor van Sandbrink, for your position. Uh, 
Dear candidate, Mr. Ottenhoff, the time appointed for the defense of your thesis has passed and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the way you defended it. And I ask you and your company to await the results of our, deliber our deliberations and our return in this room. And therefore, I suspend this meeting. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because faith decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the
I reopen this academic ceremony. Mr. Ottenhoff, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the way you defended it, and in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Temel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite uh, Professor Temel to now take the floor. Belooft u dat u altijd volgens de beginselen van de wetenschappelijke integriteit te werk zult gaan, eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk? Ja. Krachtens de bevoegdheid, ons door de wet toegekend, volgens het besluit van de commissie hier tegenwoordig, verklaar ik hier bij u, Maarten Christian Ottenhoff, tot dokter te bevorderen, en u alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens wet en gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan zal ik zo de bul overhandigen door de rector, secretaris en de overgeleden van de promotie, ondertekend en met het grootzegel van de universiteit bevestigd. Laudatio wordt verzocht door de co-promotor. Congratulations, Dr. Ottenhoff. Thank you. I think this wonderful presentation was a worthy culmination of a scientific journey of four and a half years. A scientific journey that really started rolling when you got your driver's license. You had promised from the very beginning. And then Ironically, during this journey, you also went to the most car-focused city in the world. You went to Los Angeles, and when Martin went to Los Angeles, he had to apply for share houses, and for his share houses, he had to describe himself. And what he did was he wrote, I'm a gazellic. And then he went to great length explaining what that Dutch word means, instead of actually describing himself, because he doesn't feel very comfortable describing himself. What I think you should have done instead is ask us to describe you because we've gotten to know you very well. We would have started by telling your prospective roommates that in the Netherlands he's kind of a big deal with almost uncountable TV appearances at prime time. <laughs> we would have told them how super organized and structured you are, that the organization you have imposed on the Neural Interfacing Lab is still helping us to this very day, and that this kind of organization must also be helping in house life. In fact, Martin is so organized that the last time he moved, he wasn't even there. <laughs> Unfortunately, we would also have to talk about negative aspects. We would have to say that you give a bad conscience to most of us because we're not eating as healthy, we're not staying as hydrated as you are, and of course we're not moving as much as Martin is. For Martin, movement really is ubiquitous. Of course I already ran 10K this morning, and yeah, I did transition from top-notch hurdler to long-distance crack. So yeah, that, that's not easy for us to cope with all the time. Um, we would definitely not forget how dependable, how honest, and how much fun you are, and uh, how much we enjoyed this journey. We would probably conclude by selling that you're gezellig. And then we would go to great lengths to explain what that word means. We are so proud to see what an excellent scientist you have become, and that your self-description skills have drastically improved, and your narrative CV has now scored its very first grant, so uh, I, I think that's noteworthy. More than gezellig, I hear. We're honored to have been part of this, this scientific journey. We hope we will remain of the journey in the future, and we hope to read more self-descriptions in the future. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Herf, for a very nice laudation. Uh, dear Dr. Ottenhoff, also on behalf of the Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. And of course, I extend my congratulations, of course, to your pioneers, of course, to your wife, your family, friends, colleagues, and of course, your supervisors, Professor Temel, Dr. Herf, and Dr. Kuber. I hope you have a wonderful day and a great, great career. This is the start and an important step, an important day of the rest of your career. But keep the balance, that's also important. Um, I would like to thank the members of the opposition for their work and uh, of course uh, also the technical support team and the PEDEL for making this hybrid session possible. Then I'm almost at the moment of closing this academic session en ik ga nu even in Nederland zeggen wat ik van u verwacht. U mag verwacht, u mag zo dadelijk allemaal de zaal verlaten, behalve wellicht uh, de partner uh, en de fotograaf. Want wij gaan hier nog een foto maken met uh, Dr. Collinger op de achtergrond. En daarna gaan we nog een foto maken aan de voet van de trap. Dus u mag inmiddels al doorlopen naar Kepassa, want ik begrijp dat het daar allemaal gaat gebeuren. U mag zich ook uh, verderop in de aula opstellen, zolang u ons niet voor de voeten loopt. En dan komt er bij Kepassa wel het moment dat u iedereen kunt feliciteren. Dat gezegd hebbend sluit ik deze ceremonie. Recording stopped. What? What?